One question I've heard a lot is, should I get a Mix Pre from Sound Devices or a Zoom F4 or F8? Well, let's take a shot at that question. First of all, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you were looking for a very, very clear answer. There's no clear and easy answer to that question. That's good and that's bad. It's bad because there's no clear answer. It's good because that means there are two series of devices that are very, very good for about the same price range. The Mix Pre and the Zoom F8 both come in at around $900 US, and the Zoom F4 and Mix Pre 3 each come in at about $650 US. So there's some really great high quality audio recorders out there now that really up the gain over the previous recorders that we've had available to us over the last several years. The reason I say that there's no clear answer is that they each have features that kind of outdo each other and they each have kind of weaknesses where the other one may be a little stronger. So it really depends on what you'll be recording, how you generally record and what your workflow is, and also the priorities, what's most important to you for the types of shooting you're doing. So Let's talk about the strengths and kind of, I guess, relative weaknesses one against the other, and that should give you some good ideas about which one may work best for you. Now, first of all, if your question is, well, I just want the one that gives the best audio quality, which one is that? Go have a listen to this previous episode where we actually recorded with the Mix Pre 6, the Zoom F8, and the Sound Devices 633, which is a completely different league of recorder, much you know higher end than either one of these, um, just as a reference point and listen for yourself and see if you can tell a difference. If you're listening with earbuds, you may not even be able to tell a difference. If you're listening with high quality speakers or headphones, you may be able to tell a difference. The reality is, is that all four of them, the Mix Pre 3 and 6 and the Zoom F4 and F8, all record fantastic audio that's much better than any prosumer level recorder I've used in the past up to this point. So unfortunately, there's no clear answer of which one to get if you just want the best audio quality. All four of them are really superb. Now, just as a background, before we dive into each of the individual features on each of these, I am coming from the perspective of a corporate video shooter and a every once in a while, I'm also a sound mixer for another production. So that's where I'm coming from. So the reason I tell you that is that that really kind of dictates my biases, what kinds of things I'm looking for in audio recorders. And it may not be the exact same thing you're looking for. So I just want to be clear on that so you understand what my biases are coming into this and the perspective from which I'm kind of talking about all these features. In addition, just so you're aware, I purchased the Mix Pre 6, the Zoom F8, and the Zoom F4 all with my own money. So I'm not being sponsored by anyone. No one's paying me to make this episode. These are my own opinions coming from my own biased perspective. So let's get to talking about the features and the relative strengths of each of these. I'm going to talk about the Zoom F4 and the Zoom F8 together. There obviously are some differences. And again, go take a look at the Zoom F4 review if you're interested in what those differences are. I've also got a full review for the Zoom F8. We've also got lots of other videos. All of them are up in this upper right-hand corner with the little I menu. If you hover over that, press that, you'll see a whole bunch of videos I've talked about. So I'm not going to go into depth in terms of getting the audio samples for each of these right here. First of all, one thing that's very important to me is powering options. If you're out on a shoot and you're out for, say, somewhere between four hours and 12 hours, which is a kind of a typical production day, um, powering is pretty important. And if you have to change your batteries every hour and a half, that becomes a real problem <laughs> and a serious annoyance that can also be a costly thing as well. So if you ran out of batteries in the middle of a take and you didn't realize it, um, that means you have to do a retake, and that can actually get pretty problematic. If you're just working on a passion project and you have all the time in the world, well, maybe not this, that big of an issue, but if you're actually getting paid to do a job, that's an issue, and so you need to have a solid powering set of options ready to go. The nice thing about the Zoom F4 and F8 is that they do come with a tray for eight AA batteries, and I found, depending on how many microphones you're bringing in and what you're recording, that that powers the unit from about... I think generally about two and a half hours to maybe three and a half hours. So it depends on what you're doing. So that's nice. But you can also add a variety of different other types of batteries via the, th the four pin high rose input. And this is a really nice professional type of locking connector. I think it's really awesome that Zoom put that on these recorders. And it opens up the possibility of adding all sorts of very high quality professional grade batteries 
uh, from, say, you know, V-mount or Anton Bauer batteries. And if you want something a little smaller, the MP1 style batteries, which are often used with professional audio recorders, you can also use um, even USB battery banks. And in fact, for the Zoom F4 and F8, I recently bought this battery. I'll put a link for this down below if you're interested. Your typical USB power bank cannot provide 12 volts typically. So this one's a little bit specialized, but it's very affordable, less than $40. Um, then you add the cable and you're able to power these units for hours. If you want to be able to control your recorder remotely using an app on your phone or tablet, that is possible with the Zoom F8 only. The F4 cannot do that. So we're gonna put that aside for just a minute while we talk about this. On the Zoom F8, you can use an app on iOS. So that's Apple iPhones and iPads. Zoom has not produced up to this point an app for Android. So a lot of people were disappointed about that. I, I guess I can understand that, you know, that is disappointing if you are an Android phone user. Um, but if you do have iOS um, or an iPad, um, you can control this. And it's a pretty nice app too. It allows you to set up each of the inputs in terms of the gain. It also allows you to mix, use a fader to pull the level of one of the inputs back individually. It allows you to enter metadata as well. So that is notes about each of the takes and things of that nature. So it's a really fantastic app. Um, unfortunately, it is only iOS and it is only for the Zoom F8. One of the things I absolutely love about the Zoom F series of recorders is that there is also this add-on called the Zoom F Control or FRC8. Um, this doesn't add any additional functionality per se to the Zoom F4 and F8, but what it does give you is much better controls to work with. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the controls on the, those two recorders in just a few minutes here. But this makes it like a proper mixer. And this is a sort of a traditional mixer with linear faders is what these are. You have your gain trim here, this is your amplification. This is what you use to attenuate or pull back the levels while you're recording on an individual microphone. You have your master fade. Um, so you have all these really fantastic controls um, you have some kind of quick buttons here that get you around the menus and things of that nature a little bit more quickly. You have your um, encoder here, which allows you to make selections within the menus and select items. Of course, you have your transport, which is record, play, stop, fast forward, fast back. And then of course you have a control here for your headphone output volume. This is really, really, really nice if you're doing, if you're actively mixing a piece. So if you're actually listening to it, and actually making adjustments in real time, this is a really, really valuable tool for that. Um, it is about a $350 tool, so <laughs> there is a, there's a cost involved with it, but it's really great to have that option if you're gonna be doing the types of recordings where you need to do that. For example, panel discussions or recording a band live and things of that nature, this makes it very, really, really nice to be able to do that where you can create a, a really nice mix at the same time that you're recording individual microphone channels in the same file. So this is really nice from that standpoint. So if that's something important to you, that is something that's offered with the Zoom F series of recorders. One of the practical issues with digital recording, regardless of which device you use, is that if your talent or sound source suddenly gets very loud, louder than you expected, what you often end up with in your recording is digital clipping and distortion, and it sounds absolutely awful. So there are a couple of different ways that manufacturers have gone about producing tools that will help eliminate that issue or control that issue a little bit better. One way is using what's called safety tracks. Another way is using something called limiters. Now, technically, the Zoom F4 and F8 both have safety track recording feature, and they also have digital limiters. However, there is a nuance about limiters. Uh, someone's talking on a microphone, you know, saying their lines for a film, and they suddenly get louder than you expected. What happens is you get that clipping. Well, what a safety track does is a safety track actually records that single microphone to two different microphone channels, two separate channels. So kind of two separate tracks, if you will. It records the first one at the level that you set. It records the second one, again, the same mic, at a lower level on that secondary track. So in post, what you can do is if you do get a situation where the talent gets very loud suddenly and does clip on the main track, the secondary track or the safety track shouldn't be clipped. And in post, you can actually cut in that second track and make it sound very, very nice. On the other hand, what a limiter does is a limiter actually tries to take care of that for you in real time while you're recording. So a limiter is really nice because then you don't have any work in post to do if it's able to capture that input level and kind of pull it back before it clips. The problem on the Zoom F series is that the limiters are digital. 
So what happens is that damage, that clipping and distortion can already occur before the limiters kick in. And that was just kind of a, a weird thing. I don't understand why a lot of the kind of the prosumer and consumer grade recorders are doing that. Um, I think it's to save money because analog limiters cost money. They're a separate component that they have to put in the recorder. Um, so I would really say that digital limiters don't really do a lot for you in terms of preventing clipping and distortion on the Zoom F series, but they do have the safety track feature. So you can record a single microphone to two separate channels at a lower level on the second one so that if you do get a really loud sound source, suddenly, you know, someone starts screaming or yelling or laughing, then it will be recorded to that secondary track at a lower level, and you'll be able to use that in post. So overall, I guess I see the limiters on the Zoom F8 and F4 as kind of a weakness. However, they do have the safety recording feature, so that's a nice, I guess, consolation prize. Another super nice feature on the Zoom F series is they both have two SD card slots. So you can essentially record the exact same thing to two separate cards. You also have some flexibility. You can record, say, for example, a wave, lossless wave file to one card and an MP3 file to another card. So you have a lot of options there. That gives you some flexibility, and it also gives you redundancy and safety so that if one of the cards go bad, you still have the recording on another card. Really, really nice feature. One of the things that the Zoom F series have done is they provide a whole lot of inputs. The Zoom F8 has eight XLR TRS combination inputs. So you can input microphones, you can input line level feeds. So say, for example, if you wanted to record the sound coming out of a mixing board at a live concert, you could do that as well. The only quirk with the Zoom F series is that the only way to get line level is in is to use a quarter inch. And the only way to get mic in is using XLR. That's not necessarily a showstopper, it's just a quirk. Um, what that means in practical terms is if you are going to be recording line level, you're probably going to need to get more cables that have a quarter inch on this side if you need XLR on the other side, or they're going to need to be quarter inch to quarter inch on, um, you know, to get out of the mixer and into the Zoom F series. So kind of a little quirk, not a big deal, not a showstopper, but you may need to buy more cables. In addition to that, both the Zoom F4 and F8 have this accessory input here that allows you to buy an additional accessory that you can bring two additional uh, microphones or line level signals in, and it can record those. The only limitation is, is that that module does not provide phantom power, so you, it's really not meant for condenser microphones, unless they have their own power source. Um, but really, I see that mainly to be used to get additional two additional line level inputs in. So if you're recording from a mixer, um, or you're getting you know individual microphones that have already been amplified somehow, you can get two more lines in here. Now here's where things get a little bit weird on the Zoom side. On the Zoom F8, for example, they have these two miniature XLR outputs. So they're balanced outputs, that's great. Um, you do have to use some adapters. It comes with the adapters to adapt to a regular size XLR output. Not a big deal. But the thing that's odd about it is that this is consumer line level output, not professional level line output. So that's one of those things where I just sort of scratch my head and say to Zoom, what were you guys thinking? Because you put so many professional features on here and then the line outputs are consumer level. Not sure why they did that. Um, there is also a, an unbalanced output if you are going to feed the audio to say, for example, to a DSLR or mirrorless camera, you can do that as well. So they have lots of options, but it was just kind of a head scratcher that it's only consumer line level output here, which could make it a little bit difficult to hook it up to cameras that have a line level input, say for example, a cinema camera or a uh, sort of a news gathering type of video professional camera, um, you're going to potentially run into some issues there. So I don't understand why they did that. And while it's nice to have balanced outputs, it would have been really nice to have professional line level as well. The nice thing on the Zoom F series is they use a quarter inch jack for the headphone output. The This is one thing that I was a little bit critical of the Zoom F series before. The headphone output is, I would say, okay, but not stellar. It's very, I want to be clear on this because some people kind of gave me some grief about this. <laughs> it is completely usable. I just want to be very clear about that. It's completely usable. It just doesn't sound as nice and it doesn't sound as clean as uh, the output on the Mix Pre series. So some people kind of use that as kind of a showstopper issue. Like I'm not going to buy a Zoom F series because the headphone output is horrible. Well, it's not horrible. It's just a little bit colored from my experience and doesn't sound as clean and as nice as those that I'm used to on the, the 
either the sound devices <laughs> 6 series, which I wouldn't expect it to necessarily be that good, but it's also not quite as nice as those on the Mix Pre series that we're going to talk about next. Zoom F4 and F8, in terms of form factor, size are pretty much identical. They look a little bit different, and they, they kind of see the, the build is a little bit different here, like this is an inset here, or it's a solid piece here. Um, but in terms of size, they're pretty much identical. In terms of weight, they're very similar as well, so there's not a lot of difference. They're small. Um, it's nice because they are quite small, but that's a trade-off as well. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we start talking about the control layout, especially on the Zoom F8. Both the Zoom F4 and F8 can be used as an audio interface with your computer. If you're not familiar with what that means, you can connect this to your computer using a USB cable. Then what happens is that this becomes the sound input and output for your computer. So if you want to record microphones directly to your computer, you plug them into the Zoom F4 or F8, and they can be recorded directly to your computer. Or if you want to listen to the sound from your computer, you can listen on the headphone output, or you can hook up near-field monitors or speakers to your Zoom F series, and it becomes the sound card, essentially, for your computer. And it's a very high-quality one. Digital to analog converters are good, and so I think this is a very capable audio interface. The only warning I would give is a lot of people say, hey, I can buy one of these, and I can use this as my field recorder and my audio interface in, on my edit computer. Well, yeah, that's true. You can do that. It's not the same as most audio interfaces from the standpoint that every time you turn it on, first of all, you have to power it somehow, so you can plug into AC power, so that's not necessarily an issue, but just something you need to know about. It cannot be powered from the computer itself. You must supply power separately to the Zoom F4 or F8. And every time you power it on, you have to go into the menus, kind of do some menu diving to get it into audio interface mode. So that's not necessarily a huge issue, <laughs> but I just want you to make sure that you're not going in with thinking that it's just a matter of flipping it on just like you would any other dedicated audio interface for computers. This one takes a little bit more work to get it set up each time. Build quality is super substantial for both of these. Again, all metal framing here. The only thing that's not really metal um, are the controls here are plastic on the Zoom F8. The encoder is actually metal and nicely damped. Um, I believe that the headphone um, dial here is also metal. The transport controls are kind of a hard plastic. And it, it all seems like it'll hold up well. Um, but these are a little bit more plasticky than I'd like, I guess, but not a huge deal. Again, they're protected by these metal straps out on the front, so if you did drop it directly on the surface here, those straps would protect it from smashing all of that, so that's really good as well. And, um, you know, everything, like the battery door is metal. Um, everything seems very, very solid. I have no complaints, really, uh, no substantive complaints about the build quality of the Zoom F4 or F8. Now, ergonomics is a little bit different matter. And fortunately, there's that Zoom F control control surface that can get you out of it. But I find the Zoom F8 in particular, not so much the Zoom F4, but the F8 is a little bit too cramped to work quickly with. Um, and for example, here, here is how I enable that channel. And there's this tiny little button here that says PFL on it is how I get into the setup for that channel. So I need to, you know, for example, turn on the phantom power turn on a high-pass filter, turn on the limiter, so on and so forth. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to use. I, I don't know if I have particularly, I have long fingers, but I don't have particularly fat fingers, um, but I still find these difficult to work with other than just getting a, you know, getting a microphone set up initially. But if I have to make adjustments while we're recording, this is kind of difficult to work with, to be entirely honest. So that's something to keep in mind. And I think, um, you know, it's a consideration, definitely, from the ergonomic standpoint. Another thing that is a little bit wonky in terms of ergonomics, or not ideal, I guess it's it's not a showstopper again. It, it's not something to say, I'm not going to buy this because of this thing that Curtis said. <laughs> don't, don't use it as something like that. After all, I bought both of these. I love both of these. I use them. Um, but the menu structure on the Zoom F series is not quite as... Um, efficient to use as the Mix Pre series, which we're going to look at in a little bit. Let me give you an example here. So if I come back out and I turn on this channel and I go into the setup, if I want to turn phantom power on, I go into the sub menu. Now I go into another sub menu. I change it to on. I select that and then I come out with two other taps. Again, it's it's just not as efficient as it could be. I think it would be nice if you could somehow have the setting just right here. Just click once, turn it on, click again, and be on your way. Um, 
it's a little bit, there's a there's a, just a few more clicks there than I think are really absolutely necessary. So again, it's not a huge complaint, but I think it is something that Zoom could improve upon. Now, again, all those not so great things I said about the controls on the Zoom F8. Um, again, the nice thing is, is from Zoom, you do have the F control. So you have an out if you are, <laughs> if you need a bigger surface where you are gonna be actively mixing and adjusting settings while you're recording. It's really nice to have that other option there. Another professional level feature that both the Zoom F4 and F8 have is timecode input and output. Inside of the Zoom F4 and F8, there is a timecode generator. Technically, it's a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. It's a highly accurate timecode clock that writes timecode to the metadata on all of your audio clips. And it allows you to sync up with other timecode generators, which would then connect to your camera, for example, so that that makes um, it so that your camera also records timecode. And it makes it super simple to sync up in post. Great option, really impressive that they included such a high quality temperature compensated crystal oscillator or time code generator in the devices themselves. In my test, they held up very, very well. We synced them to a tentacle sync time code generator and eight hours later, these were both still in sync. They were off by a tiny, tiny fraction of an individual frame. So they really stay in sync nicely over time. And uh, that's a really interesting and nice professional feature included here. One area where the F4 and the F8 differ quite significantly is their screen. You can see the screen on the F8 is bigger. It is also brighter. It is also fully color and higher resolution than the F4. Is that a practical issue on the F4? Is this inferior in some ways? Well, I think actually, yes, in some ways it is. Uh, before I go to that though, they're both viewable out in direct sunlight. So that's not an issue. Um, can you get everything done that you need to with the F4 screen? Yeah, you certainly can. But I would say that where this became a little bit problematic for me, I think is the lower resolution makes it a little bit more difficult, for example, here. So I can cycle through the different views. You can see here, for example, most of the metering views don't even show you um, what each of those lines represent in terms of decibels. There's only one view that does that. Um, so you have to kind of memorize what those are unless you're going to be using this particular view. This particular view I don't like to use all that much because it doesn't show the isolated tracks. It doesn't show each individual mic input level. You have to go back to one of these others to see that. And then you don't have the numbers showing you what the, those lines each represent. <laughs> it's easy to figure out, okay, that middle one is minus 12 dB, which is often kind of where you're targeting, maybe a little bit lower than that. So it's not a huge deal. But also this screen is a lot slower than this screen. And that actually becomes a problem in terms of what we call the ballistics of the meters. So it's a little bit harder to see what's actually happening because the screen responds quite a bit slower than a normal LCD, you know, this kind of screen. So um, I haven't found it to be a massive issue, but it's definitely not as nice to work with as something like the F8. Can you make good recordings with this? Yes, of course you can. Does it make it a little bit harder to see where your levels actually are? Eh, a little bit. Um, you miss some of the transients. It just can't react quickly enough to really represent some of those transients. So that's an interesting thing as well. So it's a lower price point, but you're also not getting as nice of a screen on the F4. Also, just to be clear, these are not touchscreen. Everything is controlled via the encoder and the buttons. Um, touching the screen does nothing. All right, let's move over to the Sound Devices Mix Pre. This is the Mix Pre 6 here. The Mix Pre 6 has four combination XLR TRS input jacks. And you might be asking yourself, well, why is it, why is it the Mix Pre 6 then? It only has four inputs. <laughs> Actually, it does have a input five and six on a 3.5 millimeter jack right here. That can be used to bring in a stereo microphone. A lot of lavalier microphones will work with this as well. Um, but this jack can also do some other things as well. So technically, yes, there are six inputs. In practical terms, in terms of XLR inputs, there are four. In terms of powering options, it comes with a four double A battery sled. Um, and that gets you somewhere around, oh, I would say, depending on how many microphones you're powering, maybe somewhere between an hour and a half to two and a half hours. So it's not a huge amount of time, but there is also an eight double A battery sled you can buy optionally. And there is also this battery sled, which will hold Sony NPF style batteries. And it'll hold actually two of them. This one is a little bit different in terms of how it fits in. If you have both of the slots filled with those types of batteries, um, that makes this a kind of a 
unusual shape. This is really made for putting in a sound bag. It's not really made for, um, you know, typical just setting it on the table or anything like that. <laughs> Although I suppose you could put something under here and do that if you wanted to. Some people criticize the MixPre for that. For me, not a huge deal. I'm generally going to only use this if I'm working in a bag anyway. Um, but that's another option as well. Now, in addition to that, there is a USB-C input on the side of the unit here. And what this allows you to do is a variety of things, not only to connect it to your computer to use as an audio interface, but also to power the MixPre. And what that means in practical terms is that you can use, say for example, USB-C battery banks to power your MixPre. That's a really nice option as well. Now, that's all nice, and that gives you a lot of options in terms of powering the MixPre. But there are some downsides as well. It's not the most robust connector. You can easily pull a USB-C cable out accidentally. Um, you know, you could always have your AA batteries and it would continue to be powered as long as you had power here. So it's not necessarily a showstopper, but it would be nice to have a high rose input like we have on the Zoom F4 and F8, which is a little bit more robust and it's locking. So is that a downside? Well, I guess that's up to you. Again, if you're gonna be operating and you're gonna be careful about it, um, and you're not going to be running around a whole lot, <laughs> then this is probably just great. Um, but if that leaves you feeling uncomfortable, well, then definitely look at the Zoom F series instead. Really great news. If you want to remotely control your MixPre with an app on your phone or tablet, the MixPre supports apps on both iOS, Apple devices, and on Android as well. So that really opens up some possibilities there. If you are an Android phone or tablet owner, and you would like to have those remote features, you can do that with the Mix Pre series. Now, the app on the sound devices side is a little bit different. It's called the Wingman app, and it's actually quite good. It doesn't allow you to do quite as many things as the Zoom app does, but I think they did that intentionally. And let me explain what I mean by that. So for example, you can start and stop recordings on the remote app. You can watch your meters um, on none of the apps, both on the Zoom side or the sound devices side. You cannot plug headphones into your phone and listen to or monitor the sound. There's just not enough bandwidth on Bluetooth to really do that. So just to kind of set your expectations. You can also enter metadata. What you cannot do on the Wingman app on the sound devices side is you cannot mix. You cannot control the fader while you're recording from the app. You have to actually come up to the device to do that. Now, that sounds like a real downer and a bummer, but to be honest, um, I think that was an okay decision, and here's why. On the Zoom app, where you can control a fader, it's really wonky. Um, it, I don't find it to be very ergonomic, because what happens is, when you go to change the fader, and you put your finger down on the screen, it automatically jumps three decibels. No matter how gently or how much finesse you use, it jumps way too much initially. And that's actually audible, that kind of a jump. So... For me, I don't find the mixing feature all that great on a surface like that, but other people may have another opinion and may be just fine with that. So your mileage may vary. With the MixPre 3 and 6, there is a USB-A input on the side as well. That allows you to connect a standard USB keyboard that allows you to enter metadata and notes and change project names, change file names, all those sorts of things. Makes it very easy to keep your footage very, very well organized. Um, however, the Mix Pre series does not have the equivalent of an F control surface like the Zoom series recorders do. So, if you were really looking for a proper, sort of more traditional mixing style control surface, unfortunately, that's just not an option on the Mix Pre side. Now, is that a showstopper? Again, only you can decide how important that is to you. And that's why, again, I'm kind of illustrating here there's no clear answer about which of these devices is the best. There's no such thing as the best. There's something that suits certain situations and certain people better than others. One thing where the Mix Pre really shines is that it does have proper analog limiters. We described all that previously in the Zoom section. And what that means in practical terms is that if your talent suddenly gets very loud, louder than you expected, they would normally clip on most recorders, but on the Mix Pre, that limiter kicks in, pulls the level down, and prevents it from clipping and distorting. So you have a lot less work in post, and you can avoid retakes in those situations. So really, really nice feature. And actually, from what I understand, unprecedented on a device at this price point. So normally you only find that on the higher end professional recorders that cost at least $3,000. And from my point of view, limiters are a much more effective way to do that. They save a lot of time in post versus safety tracks. 
um, just a better way to do things. For the record, the Mix Pre Series does not record safety tracks. People have asked me that. It doesn't need to, in theory, because it has the limiters instead. So if you're kind of in that mindset of I need safety tracks, it's kind of hard to let go of that, but <laughs> go ahead and test those limiters out if you do end up going this direction. I think you'll find that this is a much better way to approach solving that problem. Now, as I mentioned before, the Mix Pre 6 has four XLR TRS combination inputs. On the Mix Pre 3, there are three XLR inputs. They do not have a TRS input as well. However, all of these, whether XLR or TRS, can be used as line level inputs, which is very nice. So if you are getting a feed from a mixing board for a live panel discussion or concert or whatever it is, um, you can use this without a problem. Now, outputs is a different story on the Mix Pre versus the Zoom recorders. The Zoom recorders have balanced XLR outputs. Again, consumer level, but nevertheless, they are balanced. So you can run long cable runs without getting a lot of extra noise and hiss. The Mix Pre, on the other hand, has a 3.5 millimeter stereo output. This is the type of output that you would normally use to connect this, say, for example, to the microphone input on a DSLR or mirrorless camera. And that's just fine if that's your workflow. It's gonna be a little bit more fiddly if you are going to send the audio to a proper cinema or again, news gathering camera, video camera that has XLR inputs. You have to do some adapting um, and it's it kind of you know not necessarily the optimal type of setup. So that's kind of illustrating how I think Sound Devices was very particular about who they were designing this device for. This was not really meant for those types of workflows where you have to send a balanced signal to the cinema camera or the ENG news gathering camera. Um, it's really made for workflows where you're working probably more likely either recording completely separate from the camera, if it is a cinema type camera or a ENG professional video camera. But if you do wanna send audio to the camera, it's really kind of assumed that you're gonna be using a mirrorless or a DSLR style camera instead. So what that is kind of a design trade-off, what that allows them to do is it's a much smaller output. It saves a lot of room and allows them to keep the device smaller and lighter. So it's not good or bad. It's just a design trade-off that's optimized for certain workflows. So that's where, again, I say the Mix Pre is a really great device, but if you really need balanced XLR outputs pretty much all the time, it may not be the best choice. And that's where a Zoom might be a better choice or even something else might be a better choice. The headphone output on the Mix Pre series is actually quite impressive. I was a little disappointed at first to see it's a 3.5 millimeter output um, because it's a little bit less robust than quarter inch, but the, again, that's another thing where it was a design trade-off. They can keep the device much smaller by using a smaller output jack. So the great thing about it though is that it sounds fantastic. It is the best sounding uh, headphone amplifier on a field recorder that I've heard in the sub $1,000 price range. So it's very clean. It helps you quickly and easily identify any potential recording issues, which is kind of the critical thing for headphone outputs on a field recorder. Time code was something that they did a little bit differently on the Mix Pre as well. It does not include an inbuilt time code generator like the Zoom F4 and F8 do. However, um, they have a kind of a clever approach to addressing that issue by having a couple of inputs that can take time code if you decide to add time code to your workflow later. Again, for those that aren't familiar with time code, what that allows you to do, it's a very precise clock. You record to your audio recorder, you also record to your camera at the same time, and then in post, it's very easy to sync those two up. So the way that they've done that on the Mix Pre series is they have either a 3.5 millimeter input for a time code generator or an HDMI input. What this means in practical terms is you can connect a more traditional time code generator via the 3.5 millimeter input, and it records that to the metadata of the audio clip that you record. So it doesn't take up an audio channel, it just records it as part of the metadata saying, okay, this file started when the time code clock said this time. And your camera does the same thing, and then in post you sync them right up and that's great. So you could use a, so, something like a tentacle sync, like an uh, ambient nano locket, or any of those other time code generators that can input to 3.5 millimeter, which is pretty much any of them. Now, in addition to that, and this is a really cool feature, you have this HDMI input here, a micro HDMI input. What that allows you to do is that for cameras that can feed time code via HDMI, like a Panasonic GH5, you can actually connect your Panasonic GH5 to the Mix Pre 6 or 3. And what that does is it sends time code from the camera to the recorder. You're gonna have the exact same time on your audio clips as you have on your camera clips, 
And so it's very easy to sync them up in post. And what's more than that is it, this can actually take HDMI control signals. So when you start recording on your camera, your Panasonic GH5, for example, this will also start recording at the same time without having to press the record button on this also. Really, really nice feature. So you don't accidentally forget to press one. The only thing is, the only limitation is, is you have to be within an HDMI cable length between the camera and the recorder to make that work. Now, you can mount it. There's a quarter 20 screw on top. You can mount this underneath your camera if you're gonna do that type of workflow. But that's a really cool feature for those that are shooting with something like the Panasonic GH4 or other cameras that have HDMI time code. The only downside I really see to this is that this is a micro HDMI connector. It is not the most robust connector. You know, even when you insert the cable, it kind of wobbles around a little bit. If you bump it too hard, you can pull it out or it could lose its contacts. So it's not my preferred choice of connector, but it's kind of a cool feature, again, if you if you want to do that workflow. Um, nice feature that they thought to put it in there. They kept it small, again, so they could keep the device small. So I'm sure that's, pretty sure that's why they went with a micro HDMI input. Um, ideally, it would be at least a mini or a full-size HDMI, but that would be a design trade-off and you'd have a much bigger device again. One thing you probably noticed is that the screen is significantly smaller on the Mix Pre relative to the Zoom F series. Show you that there. However, uh, and that was a concern to me when I first heard about the Mix Pre, but I think they've implemented it very nicely. It's very high resolution, first of all, it's very bright, so it can be used outdoors in direct sunlight without a problem. Um, it also is a touchscreen, and at first I thought, well, that's way too small to be an effective touchscreen, but it actually works pretty nicely. The way they've set up the menus, you can see they're nice big buttons, so it's very easy to get in there. Um, choosing what you need is very simple and straightforward. If I wanted to bring a line level input there, I could do that. You can see it's very quick to get around in the menus the way they've designed it. So, whereas at first I was kind of skeptical at how they set this up, in practice, I find it to work very, very well. It eliminates some of the controls you need on the surface of the device to actually control things. Um, you don't need a separate encoder, but you, you know, you've got one over here if you need it. This one here can set your headphone input level, but it can also set some other things in here. So for example, if we go into, okay, we'll click okay there. Let's go into the setup here. If I need to change the gain level, I can do that with the encoder if I need to, um, or I could just do it via the touch screen. So I've got options there. But overall, the way they've laid out these menus and the way they've implemented the touchscreen, it's actually very easy to work with, quite intuitive. And you can scroll through the different menus here by tapping there. You can set your headphone preset. Um, you can go back. Um, so they make it really quite nice and quite straightforward to get around and get what you need quickly. So I feel like um, it's a less onerous sort of menu experience than you get with some other devices like the zoom is a little bit more fiddly to get what you need to. Not as bad as a Sony camera, mind you. <laughs> Sony cameras are some of the worst I've ever used. And I'm not saying I don't like Sony cameras, I'm just saying their menus are really bad. Um, the Zoom F series is better than Sony cameras, but this is even better than both of those. Um, so I think they've really done a nice job implementing this touchscreen, and I think it works very well. Now, the only other thing that I was kind of concerned about is that it's less real estate to show the meters, but the meters actually work very nicely. Um, you know, I'm getting a little older, so my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be, but still the meter ranges from minus 50 to zero dB full scale. And the ballistics are very good. It's a very fast and responsive screen. So I find that it works quite nicely. Size and weight. Now this is where the Mix Pre really shines. I wish I had a Mix Pre 3 here to show you. I don't, unfortunately, this is the six. You can see that the, relative to the Zoom F8, it's smaller this way and this way. Um, it's even a little smaller. Um, it's not as deep as well. Um, it's also lighter weight, but you might be thinking, okay, well, do they have to sacrifice on build quality? And I think the answer is really no. This is this feels like a solid, it's like two pieces of aluminum that are incredibly, like molded aluminum. It's incredibly tough. It feels like, um, and I mean this quite literally, that you could drive a car over this and it would not crush this. It's that sturdy. Um, it also has the straps up front so that if you did drop this on the control surface here, it would protect that. Likewise on the sides. Um, some people were skeptical of this battery sled system, but I found it actually to be quite robust. It's a very high grade, somewhat pliable plastic, and people were concerned that this would come popping off. It doesn't, it really doesn't. It is on there super firmly, um, and I've been really happy with that. 
Another thing that people complain about a little bit um, is that the SD card is buried underneath the battery tray. I haven't found that to be an issue um, because frankly, if I'm gonna take the SD card out, I'm powering down probably anyway. So not a huge issue for me personally, but it might be for you if that's really, really important to you. Some people complained about that. Another thing in terms of ergonomics with the Mix Pre is that these knobs, um, and actually overall the button layout and the way they're implemented, I think works quite a lot better. The control transport buttons are all backlit, so you know what's going on at any given time, even if you're working on a dark set, which is, you know, sounds a little silly, but actually that's a very serious practical issue. And I've run into that with the Zoom series is all those controls are not backlit. So on the Zoom F8 in particular, if I need to find a particular trim control, if I'm in a dark set, it's hard to find these. And I've got to either have a flashlight or turn the light on my um, phone on to be able to find the right one. On this, on the Mix Pre, it's much more straightforward. Um, you can see, you know, you also get these ring lights around each of the inputs so you know when signal's coming in on one of those. You also know when it's clipping, um, but it's also easy, very easy to find it. You know if you're stopped, you know if you're recording at a glance in the dark, all very, very nice. So the faders in, in addition are much, I think, easier to work with. They're spaced apart a little bit more nicely. They're bigger. Um, it's easier to make adjustments with them. So I find that really, really nice as well. So there are some significant things and some thought that went into the Mix Pre series where I feel like the Zoom they kind of cram some things in a little bit more. So overall, which one should you buy? Well, I can't answer that for you. Hopefully looking through those features kind of gave you some ideas of what might work better for you. What I can tell you, and again, this is from my own very subjective biased opinion based on the type of work that I do. I actually found that I preferred the Mix Pre in most cases. Now there are a few circumstances where I would still reach for the Zoom series first, um, but for a lot of the cases where I'm recording and I need to keep things small um, and I'm not going to be working from a table, almost always I will choose this to work with just because of the feature set and the ergonomics and things of that nature. On the other hand, if I'm going to be working from a desk for a, you know, a large recording session and I'm going to be actively mixing, I'm going to really want to use that F control. And then in those circumstances, I prefer the zooms. Now, Zoom F4 versus F8, unless you need the eight inputs and the remote iOS app, I think the F4 is probably, uh, that's a tough one. I don't really know. <laughs> if you have the money to spend on the F8, it's really nice. And you don't mind the kind of crowded control panel here for the things you're doing, that's not gonna be an issue. Then that's great. I think the F8 is really nice. The screen is much nicer. The iOS app is very nice. This one is a tougher decision, I think, between the F4 and F8 eight if you have money for both. Um, you know, I do like that the, this is less crowded just because there are only four inputs. I like that they're full size XLR outputs if you do need those. Um, I do like that it's a quarter inch headphone output. That's very nice. Um, the F4 actually has a camera return, which the F8 does not have, interestingly. Uh, and I should also say the Mix Pre has that as well. We didn't cover that previously. But, um, I don't know, I really like the F4 as well. The screen is again, a little bit of a downer. It'd be awesome if we could have the F8 screen on the F4, but again, that's one of the th choices they made for to differentiate between those two products. So it is what it is. But in short, I choose this. However, I think there is very much a case for where these are gonna be a better choice if you need more inputs. The Zoom F8's hard to beat. <laughs> um, so there are just so many different factors that hopefully going over those features gives you some ideas of what's gonna work best for you. If there was something I didn't answer here, some specific things that you want to know about, go ahead and leave a question down below. I'll do my best to answer that. Also, if you have not already subscribed, make sure you do that and we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound. And if you wanna be notified when those new videos show up every week, just go ahead and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button. And we'll talk to you again soon.